Hi, everybody. You are the hardcore faithful. Well done. If you're like me, you walked out this morning and thought, I know I put my car somewhere. Uh, um, so it's always nights like this when we find out the hardcore faithful are here. I want to invite you to turn to the book of Luke, chapter 2. It's Advent. Advent comes from the Latin, which means toward the coming or in preparation for the coming. And it says that's the idea of Christ is coming. Um, and the, the birth of Christ is the coming of Christ into the world. And so Advent is when we turn ourselves towards the celebration of his birth, which is about the Christ who continues to come into our world. And uh, so we're going to talk. There'll be some sort of sermon at some point, and then, um, um, and then all sorts of other things. How about um, that new Christmas song? Is that not brilliant song? How many of you? It's like got this kind of hoot nanny shuffle, kind of y'all come kind of thing. And I think maybe we should just have a bit of a sermon, and then we should do that song again in proper hoot nanny blow the roof off kind of form. Is that correct? So, so y'all. Um, we're going to go through some scriptures and stuff, but then I think at the end we just need to do that in its proper way. Because now that you know it and you're warmed up, you can really give it what it deserves. So we're going to do that. And um, a couple other things. Michelle, why don't you come? We're gonna, um, I, want, I want you to um, hear again from one of our own. Um, this is Michelle Cameron. Everybody, good evening, Michelle. Uh, last January... Um, Michelle and I did a sort of kind of interview thing here on a Sunday and you got to hear kind of what she's been up to. And how many of you remember that last January when Michelle was here? Excellent. 13 people remember it, so it'll be good. Um, and um, Michelle and her family live in the Black Hills neighborhood, which is kind of just southwest of downtown um, Grand Rapids. And since um, they've moved in a while ago, all sorts of people from our community have been moving into this neighborhood, which um, is an un- <laughs> must be a neighbor. Um, it's a really powerful thing that is happening in a neighborhood where the needs are very visceral, very very in your face, like this very under-resourced in the kinds of things like food and clothing and heat and such. And they have been doing, it's a really a powerful thing going on there. So, hi, welcome. Thank um, you. And let's, let's just give people an idea of some of the things that are going on in the neighborhood. Um, somebody donated a warehouse space to build like a community center. So how's that going? Right. We have about 8,000 square feet in a warehouse at the bottom of our hill in the neighborhood. And it's divided up into two floors. So the top floor is pretty much done. We have a, a few more things, carpeting and a few more things to throw in there. Um, but the bottom floor isn't finished at all. So we're hoping to be working out of the top floor and maybe by January, February, and then hopefully the money will come for the bottom floor. Okay. And and it's what what goes on at the warehouse? What's it for? At the warehouse, we're going to be doing all the programs that Dorchester House does, plus all the programs that the other ministries in the neighborhood do. There's four or five ministries from different churches that all work in the Black Hills neighborhood. So we've named ourselves United in Christ, and we're throwing all of our other names aside and in the neighborhood we're united in christ and so we're doing tutoring and god's club there um christmas and so like with the tutors um tell tell us a bit about where are you with how many tutors and do you need more tutors for uh let's back up one quick thing every service i forget to mention the prayer thing there at the warehouse every monday night at 6 30 there's a group that meets and just prays for the warehouse in the neighborhood so you're bored on a Monday night, come on down. Um, then at Dorchester House, we do tutoring, and we need another 5, 10, 15 tutors to go one-on-one with the same kid every week, every Wednesday, from January until June would be awesome. And, and a lot of the kids have no help at home, so right. this is huge right. for them. This is really huge for them. They don't have support systems at home. Moms and dads are working two or three jobs or... Um, other things are keeping them busy. And so this is a great support for these kids to, if they have questions for math, then they know where to go. They have a place to do that. And so we wanna, want to show them that education is super important and that with Christ in their life and a good education, they can pretty much go anywhere they want. And then God's Club is two God's, Saturdays a month? Yep, God's Club is the last two Saturdays of every month. And it's like a vacation Bible school time if you want to come down and play with the kids and share the love of Jesus Christ by being a positive role model. Awesome. I remember awesome. Um, being at a God's Club with you and you were feeding the kids. And there were kids putting the food that was left over um, in their pockets. <laughs> like, like they were putting hot dogs in their pockets. Um, and... 
it was because like the one, they, they did not know if they would eat later right. that day. And you all were providing food and they were just stuffing it in their pockets as fast as they could because this was food and they didn't know when they would eat again. Exactly. During the school year, they, most of the kids in our neighborhood get breakfast and lunch at school and parents provide dinner. They provide one meal a day. And then um, on the weekends, they still provide one meal a day. Or during Christmas vacation, they still provide one meal a day. But school's not around on the weekends, and it's not around during Christmas vacation, so you might not get breakfast and lunch. So this is the perfect opportunity, Rob has talked about this before, where you can play ding-dong ditch in my neighborhood with a bag of groceries. Leave a bag of groceries on pretty much any door in the neighborhood you would like, and uh, put, for the love of Jesus Christ, or something like that, Jesus loves you, or whatever, and then ring the doorbell and run away. (laughs) <laughs> People here will actually do that. I know. Be I'm real, they... Somebody did that to me once. Whoever that was, that was just pretty awesome. I loved it. I loved okay, it. confess, repent, come down front right now. Who was it? <laughs> um, and so these are numbers. Uh, if people want to get involved in any of the things right. going on. If you have any questions about any of these programs, you can call me, Michelle, up there, or Karen. And if you have any questions about the warehouse, Alan is with me this evening and we'll be answering questions and if you don't want to stick around just call him later and um okay the where to get the whole warehouse done how much money to get the whole warehouse done to finish it off we need fifty thousand dollars okay can we just take care of that please could somebody just get your checkbook out who who is it (laughs) um let's just take care of that i know today people have been coming up and talking to you and stuff and and we need to just take care of that now tell us a bit uh, tell us about Christmas in the neighborhood and, and what's right. happened with Mars Hill here. We just want to say a big, giant thank you to everyone because a um, hundred of you have stepped up and sponsored a hundred families in our neighborhood. So you've decided to take it upon yourselves to buy presents and gift cards and all kinds of stuff for a for hundred families in our neighborhood. And we are just blessed and thrilled that you have stepped up to the wow. plate. Mars Hill in the past has given us funds for the warehouse, and we are so thankful for that. Um, a lot of our tutors come from Mars Hill. Some of our God's Club people come from Mars Hill. And so we just want to thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for listening and for stepping up and for either giving monetary donations or giving of your time, and, and we just have been so blessed. So 100 families have been taken care of. Will there be more families between now and Christmas who need stuff? Yes, there will be more families that will knock on my door and say, can you help us out? And so we would love if you guys, if anybody can afford to give an extra gift card or a gas card to anywhere, um, and or even a bus pass, you can go to the Rapid and buy a monthly bus pass. That would be huge. If we can hand out at this point, it's a little too hard. Time is crunched to um, get their Christmas needs, but if we can give them a gift card and provide their food, then maybe that would free up a little bit of their own money for presents for themselves. Wow. And, and why don't you tell us a bit about what happened this summer? I think that, when you told me that, I think that's very significant. Yeah, this, this story doesn't ever get easier to tell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this summer, in our neighborhood on my block, um, just a few feet away from my house, we would wake up in the middle of the night, three in the morning, Patrick and I, to gunfire. And um, we both come from middle-class neighborhoods, safe neighborhoods with families that love us, and we didn't know what gunfire sounded like. So the first time we woke up at 3 in the morning to gunfire, kind of sounds like um, a car backfiring. But when a car backfires, usually people don't scatter and take cover and run. So (laughs) we'd look out our window at 3 in the morning, and people would be running around and hiding behind fences and behind trees and... There were no cars around, so we figured it probably wasn't, um, you know, car backfiring. It's probably gunfire. And, and you hear it once, and you think, oh, it was a one-time thing. But then the next weekend it happened again, and then again, and again. And then um, finally, Patrick and I, after calling 911 a million times, and, and I have to say the police in Grand Rapids are wonderful and very helpful and very tolerant because I was on the phone a lot with them, and they were amazing. But... They couldn't get there fast enough when these things would happen. And finally, Patrick and I had to sit down with our daughters and give them a talk that I never, ever thought I would have with my children. We talked about what gunfire sounds like. We talked about what you do if you hear gunfire and how can you be safe. And that is not something I ever dreamed I would do with my children. And after Patrick and I just realized that we could not solve this on our own, we called Mars Hill, and I don't know why we didn't call you guys earlier, but, <laughs> but it took a month or so, and we called Mars Hill, 
And I talked to Margie, who is your prayer chain coordinator, if you ever need her. And um, I just went off on Margie. I just vented and vented and vented and told her how scared I was and how I didn't know what to do. And Patrick, being the father figure in the household, just wanted to be the protector. And we just, we had prayed about it, and we didn't know if God was telling us to stay in the neighborhood and be the family that stands up and calls the police and, and does the right thing, or if God was telling us that no child, even our own, should be in a situation like this, and it's time to go. It's, it's just time to go. And so after sharing all of that with Margie, she, um, she was, bless her heart, she just at the end said, all right. She said, Michelle, tonight, tonight, I'm going to send out an email, and tonight, 300 people will be on their knees praying for you and your family and their safety. That was, that was what I needed. That was the miracle. And two weeks later, it was gone. The, the people living in the house that were shooting off the guns and just disappeared. They were gone. Disappeared. <clears throat> Man. So Thank if you, you have neighbors who are on your nerves... Um, <laughs> and and uh, what came out of this? What kind of vision came out of this? Um, for the neighborhood? Well, uh, the Dorchester House team, we've sat down and, and talked a little bit and talked about what we need next. And we decided that we need prayer. We need to saturate this neighborhood with prayer. Because if you guys in two weeks can protect me and keep my family safe, I can't imagine what you can do for the rest of this neighborhood, for the rest of my neighborhood. So we've printed off, I don't know, a whole bunch of cards, a card for every neighbor, every person, not every person, every household in my neighborhood. Every house, every apartment is on a card. Now, these cards don't have names on them because we don't know every person that lives in the neighborhood, but it's every address. And we are asking that you guys come up after the service and take a card and pray for the address on your card. You might be praying for a drug dealer in my neighborhood. You might be praying for an abuser. You might be praying for um, a single mom with two kids that's 40 years old working on her GED who lives right around the corner from me. You might be praying for the lady across the street from me who is struggling to make ends meet. She has a full-time job and is trying to survive. Um, You'll be praying for myself. I'm in this pile, and Alan is in this pile, and Karen is in this pile. We need your prayers. So um, weird, I just can't wait to see what God has in store if we seriously pray for this neighborhood. Seriously pray. So no screwing around here, people who are serious about this. No screwing around. I need you guys to get up off your X, Y, Z, and I need you to pray for my neighborhood. <laughs> I love it when you say that. Uh, this, is, this is great. And so you'll be down front afterwards? I will be down front afterwards. Alan will be down front Alan afterwards, too. and we'll be handing out cards. And we just ask that if God does move you to go the next step and you want to maybe meet the family you've been praying for, if you would just call us first. We want to make sure that, it, that it's a positive experience for you because if you end up at some drug dealer's door, you might want to know how to handle that. And so you might want to give us a yeah. call. So because so, this is one of the things we keep learning is when you start praying for things and, and, and your heart gets broken for the kinds of things that break God's heart and, and praying leads you to action. It leads you to want to do, to serve, to do something. So if people have this growing sense, they can call one of these numbers, call you, get a hold of you through Mars Hill. And yeah. Um, we'll figure out something, yeah. huh? Yeah, because I certainly want to connect you with everybody. And just because you're praying for a drug dealer doesn't mean they need our prayers any less. They probably need our prayers even more. And just as much as the grandma who's raising six grandchildren that she didn't expect, or wow. or me, you know. Thanks a ton. You, you inspire us, so thank you. I hope oh, thank I hope you, you uh, I hope you are kept safe, and we 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 deeply appreciate your perseverance and that you keep going. So, so thank, thank you. you very much. I know I speak for all these people here. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, and so not all, there's still cards left over from the first two. There's still some, plenty of cards from the first two services, so you'll be down front here. Beautiful. Let me say a word of prayer, can I? God, thank you for Michelle and for Karen and Alan and their families and all, uh, just the, the amazing thing, the, the, the sort of resurrection that's happening in this Black Hills neighborhood. Uh, 
We thank you for removing um, the gunshots from next door. We live with this profound sense of dependence and mystery on how you work in the world. Um, I I thank you for the example to us of brothers and sisters who have oriented their whole lives around the path of Jesus, who, who have given themselves to the suffering and pain of the world and the joy that it brings us to hear these stories and and to hear what you're doing. And uh, we thank you that you are the God of the oppressed, that that your heart veers towards those who have been pushed to the edges, who have been forgotten, who have been marginalized, who have been stepped on. And and we want to have uh, hearts like yours. So thank you for this work in in Black Hills, for those who who this may be essentially a door into a whole other world of involvement, Um, that that this may be an end to despair and a beginning of hope because they have gotten connected with what you're doing. We we ask for those, God, right now who are wrestling with maybe this is something they're supposed to do and get involved in. Please give us tremendous guidance into what that looks like. And in the name of Jesus, everybody said, Amen. Thank you very much. It's great. All right. And then uh, last week you met David and Danielle Bolt. And they are moving to Morocco to start an environmentally friendly furniture company called Green Sahara. And uh, if you haven't been across the hall, the furniture and samples and order forms are across the hall. And you can go over and learn um, more about that. It's really stunning. Did everybody go across the hall last week? Does everybody know exactly what I'm talking about? If you didn't, go um, fight terrorism by a coffee table. And um, that's pretty much kind of how it's going. So um, go across. There's all sorts of different things you can do there in regards to Christmas. Okay. Um, Let's do, how about I'll do a sermon and then um, we'll sing. Does that sound good? Okay, that's a great idea. Um, Now, Luke chapter 2. We've been working through this story. Last week we talked about fear and we talked about joy. Luke chapter 2 verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. This is for everybody. Today in the town of of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly... A great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel. So all sorts of angels appear, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. And so the response of this good news of great joy, this birth of a savior, is this massive company of angels show up and they begin praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, wherever that is. And whatever this glory to God in the highest heaven is, on earth it means peace to those on whom his favor rests. Next week, we will explore what the peace and favor looks like on earth. This week, I'd like to explore glory to God in the highest heaven. So last week we talked about fear and joy. Next week, favor and peace. This week, glory. What what does exactly it mean, glory to God in the highest heaven? The writer Dallas Willer talks about how familiarity can breed unfamiliarity. You hear something enough that you can just speak it and you would say you know it, but you don't really have a sense of what it is. What is glory? A couple of people this week, I was asking them, what is glory? And what does it mean, glory to God in the highest? And the definitions are like glory, you know. Glory to God is like, to God, glory. <laughs> it's just like, just like school of redundancy school. Just this glory. Perhaps it's one of those terms that you sing about that you hear about, that you read about, especially if you have maybe perhaps some connection or background with church, Jesus, God, Bible, Christian faith, etc. Glory is like, oh yeah, you know, glory. But if you really ask, well, what is glory? What does it mean? What does it mean, glory to God in the highest heaven? Even for me, uh, glory, it's probably something big or has something to do with, oh, or something like that. I don't know what glory, what is glory? What's fascinating is the word glory in the original language as the scripture were written. It's a very constant, a very complex kind of nuanced sort of word. So, so tonight, a brief history of glory. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 19. For me, the best, best way to begin to understand the word glory is uh, to, to start in Psalm 19. It's, it's uh, 
the story of Christmas in the New Testament is written in the Greek language. But most of the things in the Greek language in the New Testament have some origin in the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, which is written in the Hebrew language. So sometimes, in order to make sense of something happening in the New Testament, you have to go back and kind of find the roots of an idea or a word or a concept. And so um, Psalm 19 is a classic example of the use of the word glory in the Hebrew Scriptures, which I think helps us begin to understand what it means. The heavens declare the glory of God. So this is something the heavens help us understand. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Maybe you've had that experience when there's a clear sky one night and you're with some people and somebody says, hey, look up. And you previously had not looked up. And you look up and the stars are just have just like lit up the sky. And you have this moment of, oh, wow. The, The heavens declare the glory of God. Or perhaps you've looked through a telescope or perhaps you've had opportunity to look through the the Hubble telescope, which is a bit bigger than this one, um, if you're asking for that for Christmas. And here are images that have come back from the Hubble telescope. These These are clusters and supernovas and star formations, some of them 180,000 light years away from the Earth, which gives you some sense of direction and perspective. Because 200,000 light years would be totally different. That'd be farther. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I'm glad some of you enjoyed that. I love it when they talk about this. They're like, this super, this super cluster is moving at 200,000 miles, uh, miles an hour. Oh, okay, because I can understand galaxies that are 4 billion miles across moving at 200,000 miles an hour. My mind, no problem with those dimensions. <laughs> If, if you look at these images, if you look at these pictures, if you were to gaze through a, a telescope, there, there's something within us. There, there's a sort of... How many of you, maybe it's on a clear night, or maybe it's been pictures through a telescope, or maybe it's been photos of, of star clusters, and there's something within you that just does this... There's this sense of, whoa, whoa. The sense of, ah. Maybe the best way to understand glory is simply... It's something so big so massive, so beautiful, so mysterious that it creates deep in your bones this, this almost a sense of you have to catch your breath. The word kavod is, the word glory in the Hebrew language is the Hebrew word kavod. Let me hear you say kavod. The heavens declare the kavod of God. Now kavod means weight. It means heavy, significance, honor, majesty. Kavod comes from a word kaved, which referred to a rich person who was loaded down with gold and silver and jewelry and all kind of the trappings of being extremely wealthy. And so then the word kind of morphed into kavod, which simply means heavy. It, mean, it has weight, significance. The heavens declare the, the significance, the weight, the honor, the majesty, the, the, the largeness, the abundance of God. It's, it's that sense of interacting with something that other things are light. They're temporal. If the wind blew just the right way, they'd be gone. But something with kavod is something that's here to stay. Kavod is like the kick drum. It's like the bass note of the universe. Kavod is that rumble deep in the universe of those things that aren't going anywhere. Kavod is that sense when you come face to face with something that reminds you that you are very small and it is very large. Kavod is what happens when you stare up at the stars and you are reminded of the proper proportions of size in the universe and that you aren't the most important thing in the universe. How many need that reminder from time to time? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Kavod. And so this ancient Hebrew idea of the kavod, the weight, the significance of God, and you get a glimpse of it when you see the heavens. Now, um, turn with me to the book of Exodus, chapter 33. There's this awesome interaction between God and Moses surrounding the kavod of God. Now, God and Moses have been dialoguing, have been interacting, have been conversing because God has said, Moses, I want you to lead my people out of slavery and into freedom. And Moses is wrestling this, well, if I go to these people and say to them that God wants to liberate them, they're going to have all sorts of questions. And if it's just me kind of leading them, it's not going to work, God. I'm going to need you to some way to go with me. I'm going to need help. I'm going to need them some sort of authority so these people will know that I'm just not some loner, but that I actually have you with me. And so they're having this discussion about God's presence and God's essentially companionship. And at one point, Exodus 33:17, and the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you. 
and I know you by name. Then Moses said, Now, God, show me your kavod. Moses comes and says, I want to see all of your glory. Show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all of my goodness. Does God say glory? No, no, goodness. So right away you know, huh? So God does not say, I'm going to show you all of my glory. God says, I'm going to show you, I'm going to cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So somehow, God's initial response is not, Moses, I'm going to let you see all of my glory. It's, uh, okay, I'll let you see my goodness, which is not what Moses asked for. And then he says, and I'm going to have mercy and compassion essentially on you. So there's something about God's glory that cannot be viewed fully by Moses, and it's rooted in God saying, I'm going to go easy on you. I have mercy. I'm going to have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. And then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my kavod, my weight, my significance, who I truly am, when my, my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Now the rabbis say that this is a euphemism, you will see my back. And it's a, it's a Hebrew euphemism, it essentially means to see somebody's back is to see the spot where they just were. It's as if Moses says, I want to see all of your glory. And God essentially says, there's no way you would just get torched in a sea. There's no way you can handle my fork. But the best you can handle, Moses, is you get to see the place where I just was. <laughs> How awesome is that? And then there's a little known Jewish commentary on this where God says this. Moses says, show me your glory. God says this. And then Jack Nicholson says to Moses, you can't handle the kabod. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's really old, seriously. He's, just, he's even older than he looks. That, no idea. That's awesome. Okay, that's awesome. That is funny, okay? <laughs> it's this idea of, it's, it's, as if, it's as if God says, Moses, you see the stars and you have to, like, catch your breath. You want to see all of my kavod? Who, who do you think you are? Here's the best, Moses, you're ever going to be able to handle of the full weight and significance of who God is. Moses, I'm going to let you see the spot where I just was. Central to understanding the kavod, the glory of God, is the awe, the reverence, the humility from knowing who God is and who we are. We, we, we lose track of the proportions of space and size. The, the heavens are simply a gift of reminding us th that we aren't the ones who run the universe. Moses, I'll, I'll let you see where I just was. Now turn with me over to First uh, Chronicles chapter 16. So you see this being brought up again and again and again. You see this idea of, of kavod, glory. People singing about it, speaking about it, uh, poems about it. There is something about weight and significance that is good for our psyche. It's good for our soul. It's good for us to be reminded on a regular basis of beauty, mystery, size, scope, proportion. That this is who you are, and this is the kavod of God. We need reminders. So you find passages about meditating, sharing in, proclaiming, singing, witnessing to the, the kavod of God. It's as if the writers continually say, if you lose that deep sense of awe, reverence, humility for the maker of all things, you will lose something about what it means to be human. Kavod is good for the soul. Notice what uh, 1 Chronicles 16 says, verse 23, Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim His salvation day and day. After day, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all people. So central to the kavod of God is the marvelous deeds God has done among or among all people. 
For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are his dwelling place. Ascribe to the Lord. It means give to God, all you families of the nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Speak of it. Give it to God. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. There is weight, significance to the earth and to the glory of God. Speak of it. Remind yourselves of it. Give to God the kavod that God deserves. Give to God's name the glory that God's name deserves. Center around this. Uh, last year. I was having lunch in New York City with some uh, business people who uh, have offices in Times Square. They, they live in the center of, of one of the cities that's the center of the world. They uh, look down from their office window on Times Square. They're in the center of culture. They are unbelievably driven. They've seen everything. They have every modern convenience at their fingertips. And we were having lunch and... Um, I don't know how to talk business person talk. Um, I, I fail quite quickly at that stuff. And uh, so partway through, I, I uh, started telling them stories about our church and what we're learning in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which they've heard about. And uh, very intimidating to bring up Grand Rapids in that kind of setting. And uh, I just started telling stories, um, stories like you heard tonight, just about things that we're learning things that people are doing, things that people are giving up, ways that people are reorienting their lives around simplicity and sacrifice. And just, just telling them just really basic stories about the things we're learning, the ways we're growing. And, and oh yeah, and this person, let me tell you what they've been wrestling with. is that, And, and partway through, I look over, and one of these uh, business people who, who works for a, a company you all would... She, I look over and she's got her spoon halfway between her soup bowl and her mouth and it's frozen and she has tears just streaming down her face. It, it, it's like she couldn't get enough. You can have all of the money. You can have all of the prestige. You can have everything this world offers you right here, right now, but if you don't have the kavod and that deep, profound sense of awe, reverence, worship, and respect, then in some ways you're unbelievably empty. Are you with me? This is why when you hear stories of somebody who's wrestling with, with what do you do about the gunshots, Cause, because this is the right place to be, but is it? This is why when you hear certain stories, something within you says, now that, that has weight, that has significance, that, that in some grand scheme, that matters. It's because you are encountering kavod. And we live in a culture that essentially worships at the altar of that which is changing. There's this thing that just came, and now it's going to be in for a little while, and then it's out. And, and this is hot, but then soon it's going to be not. And then there's going to be this. And, and this thing right here, if the wind blows, will be gone. We live in a culture that worships the here and the now. But what we long for are things that have always been here, are here, and will always be here. We were like hardwired for kavod. It's, it's not to me a lost metaphor that a lot of our neon lights block out the stars. It, it's, it, it's not lost as a metaphor that in a lot of areas, our strip malls and our security lights are so bright and glaring and neon that you can't see the stars. That, that's a... a a very fitting metaphor for the world we live in. We create these things and we make these things and come to think that this is the sum total of existence and then we're empty and we're bored and we're missing something. And what we're missing is a profound sense of the kavod, the glory of God. Now, in the scriptures, it isn't just the kavod of God. It isn't just that God has weight and significance. But one of the things that made the Jewish strand of worldview, the Jewish faith, begin to diverge from other worldviews is what the Jewish faith kept insisting God has done with God's 
kavod. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 8. Uh, this, this, was, this was something that you can find throughout the Scriptures. Such an unbelievably new, fresh, provocative idea that you continually find the writers of the Scriptures wrestling with the implications of, of, of whether or not this could actually be true. In Psalm 8, uh, it begins, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. So it begins with this sense of awe, respect, worship. God, you are God, we are not. Your, your glory has been set in the highest kind of place. But then, it begins to speak of human beings. Notice verse 5. You have made these human beings a little lower than the heavenly beings. And you have crowned these humans with glory, kavod, and honor. So God has kavod, but God has crowned human beings with kavod. God's glory essentially has been placed on humans. It's a, it's a profoundly high view of humanity. But now why is this? It gives explanation. You have made humans rulers over the works of your hands. Well, that's the created realm. That's creation, the environment. You've put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and all that swims, the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So you've made rulers over the, hand, over the works of your hands, put everything under their feet. So, so the text says, that human beings have been given glory, kavod. And the reason they have been given this is so that we could properly create, co-create, manage, care for this world that God has placed us in. And so God gives us weight and significance as we do this task with God and with each other. This is why last week, when you heard David and Danielle talking about moving to Morocco, it stirred, for so many people, the feedback was, okay, that is so right. It's so, it stirs something in me. Here's why. Because these people have been given this gift, this passion. They make furniture. They do something with their hands. They take it from the earth. They take the tree. They take the wood. And they make beautiful pieces of art that you can sit in. Bonus. And uh, so they have asked themselves, what does it look like to, to, to properly use this gift and passion with God? What, what does that look like? And they have looked at, at, at how God has made them and wired them, and then they've looked at, well, where in the world could, could we use this in the most God-honoring sorts of ways? Well, there's this region of the world where, where there's massive unemployment. There's also unbelievable animosity towards the West. And, and if we could go there and start this environmentally conscious furniture business, we could employ all sorts of people. We could show them... We, we could people who are, are just waiting to be essentially radicalized for terrorism. We, we could give them work and meaning and purpose. And, and in this, uh, uh, an area that has been neglected and, and has serious uh, animosity, beautiful things could happen there. What is it? It's these people have been crowned with kavod and they're using it well. And, and, they're, and they're doing something that furthers the shalom God intends for all things. See, every one of us has been crowned with kavod, a human being in the Scriptures. God has an unbelievably high view. Now, now, the problem is what we do with this energy, passion, abilities that we have. Will we use this to further the kavod of God or get steered and distracted in all sorts of other ways? Notice what it says in Jeremiah chapter 2. The prophets use a particular phrase uh, and they use it again and again, a couple pages, a couple chapters, books to the right. In Jeremiah chapter 2 is a phrase that comes up again and again throughout the prophets. They come to the people of God and they have a, a complaint. They have a charge, an accusation. And they bring up the same ex phrase we're going to see here in several different places as if they're kind of quoting each other. Jeremiah chapter 2, uh, verse 11. Has a nation ever changed its gods? Yet they are not gods at all, but my people, God says. They have exchanged their glorious God. There is this God of all kavod and honor and beauty and size and majesty. They have exchanged their kavod God for worthless idols. 
Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. He says, my, my people, I mean, they've been crowned with glory. They've been created to do such noble, beautiful things in the world. But they, but they have exchanged their glorious, kavod like God f- for these idols. They've gotten sidetracked and distracted. Ah, oh, they could be so much more. They could be so much more. Now turn with me to Luke chapter 2, and then um, we'll, we'll be done here. They have exchanged everything they could be. They've been crowned with glory and honor, and they've missed it. They've traded it in for worthless idols that don't deliver what God can give. And so they've missed out on the life God intends. Now Luke chapter 2, uh, this is New Testament. And so this is not the word kavod, because that's in the Old Testament, Hebrew Scriptures. So in Luke chapter 2, verse 14, when the writer comes to glory to God in the highest heaven, the writer had to figure out, well, now I'm working in the Greek language, and if I use kavod, people are going to be like, kavod, we don't know that word, it's not in our language. So the writer is searching in Luke chapter 2, has to find a word in the Greek language to try and essentially get at the idea of kavod. And the word here, glory to God in the highest heaven, that the writer chooses is a Greek word, doxa. Let me hear you say doxa. Doxa to God in the highest heaven. Now in Greek, the word, as it developed over time, has kind of a subtle nuance to it. The word means thought or opinion. It means to consider something. And so there is God's doxa of things, the way that God sees things. And the way that God sees things is how things are. God see, the way that God sees things has weight and significance. God's kavod here is God's doxa. It's God's true thought and opinion about something. And how God sees something is how it really is. You and I, on the other hand, we sometimes get some stinking thinking. We, we, we think one way one day, and we think one day the next. Depends on how we're feeling. Depends on who we're angry with. Depends on who we haven't forgotten. To, it, we, who, who we haven't forgiven. What, what we've forgotten. What we've remembered. For us, how we see things shifts. If things are going well, if things aren't going well. If these people are with us, if these people are against us. And so our doxa is all over the place. And so over time, the idea of doxa, when it came to God's glory, referred to essentially God's unchanging essence. God is who God has always been. God does not shift or change. And the way that God sees things, God's thought or opinion, is how things truly are. And so, you and I have this invitation to see things how God sees them. So we see this and we're confused about this and we don't understand about this and we feel this way about ourselves and then we stumble upon something like the heavens and when we see the stars, we see, oh, it's beautiful, oh, stunning, oh, it takes my breath away, oh. And at that moment, we are seeing the stars as they really are and that is God's glory. This moment in which we begin to have the same thought or opinion about something that God has. Well, then that's God's glory. That's why when you hear a particular kind of story and something within you says, now that's the way of Jesus. Now that's living a life of purpose. Now now that's sacrificing yourself for a great cause that makes the world better. When, When you have that moment... Well, that's how God sees it. That is God's doxa. That is God's glory. And so the word doxa came to mean unchanging essence. That which always has been true, is true, and always will be true. Doxa to God in the highest heavens. I would argue that the reason why Christmas continues to move us The reason why Christmas continues to move people who don't even believe in Christmas, the reason why people who are really mean all year are nice occasionally in December, correct? Why does Christmas continue to move us? Because whether we admit it or not, or even would use this kind of language, we know deep down that we've been crowned with glory and honor. We know that we were made for more. We know that there is a better place out there for us. And yet, like as one scripture says, all have sinned and fallen short of the kavod of God. 
And so we live with this tension of, what, of who we could be and yet the ways we've screwed it up, the ways we have misused our power, our strength, our passions, our abilities, our talents, our tongues, our thoughts, the ways in which we have fallen short of the kavod of God, the ways in which we have not had actions of weight and significance, the ways in which we have bought in to the temporary, the trivial, the meaningless. And so we live with this tension that we are crowned with the kavod of God and yet all the ways in which we fall short of it, our habits, our addictions, the stuff nobody knows about, the thoughts in our head, the loops that play in our head about how worthless we are. And perhaps the power of Christmas is that we know we need saving. We know we need help. And the birth of this child is an announcement that God hasn't given up on us, that God wants to rescue us, save us, redeem us, Get us back on a better kind of path. Forgive us. Wipe the slate clean. Start over. Give us new birth. Have you ever seen a manger scene with graffiti on it? No. Huh. Why? Because some things have a particular kind of kavod. Even if you don't know the story, you know that there's meaning there. You know that this baby in a manger somehow has something to do with what we all do desperately long for, which is a new start, which is a fresh start, which is somebody to not give up on us. Christmas is God's way of not giving up on us. And, and that's why it moves us. That's why people don't even believe it, believe it. That's why people who don't even affirm it, don't even want anything to do it, still it pulls up something within them. It's because we were crowned with glory. We know kavod when we see it. We want our lives to be about this and all the ways we've screwed it up and yet Christmas is God saying, I haven't given up on you. The birth of this Savior is God's way of saying, there's still time. We can still turn this around. You can be forgiven. You can start over. You, you can reclaim the kavod that you were crowned with. Let's pray. God, we live in this world where so many things, if the wind blew a different direction, they'd blow away. It's just here today and gone tomorrow. It's trivial. It's plastic. It's neon. It's got an expiration date. And yet you, your glory, the heavens, your honor, your reputation, your doxa, it is always been, is, and always will be. God, we think of Moses who wants to see all your kavod and can only see where you've just been because that's all he can handle. God, we get so proud, so self-centered, so arrogant, and we lose that awe, reverence, mystery, and respect that our souls need to thrive. Please help us reclaim that this Advent season as we reflect, as we meditate, as we ask you as you're coming into the world again, to come into our lives, to speak to us, to remind us of the high calling you have for each of us. We acknowledge all of the ways in which we have sinned and fallen short of your kavod. We trust this Jesus, this Messiah, this Son of David. proper way because now that you know it and you're warmed up you can really give it what it deserves so we're going to do that and um a couple other things michelle why don't you come we're going to um i want i want you to um hear again from a, one of our own um this is michelle cameron everybody good evening michelle uh last january um michelle and i did a sort of kind of interview thing here on a sunday and you got to hear kind of what she's been up to and how many of you remember that last january when michelle was here. Excellent. 13 people remember it, so it'll be good. Um, and um, Michelle and her family live in the Black Hills neighborhood, which is kind of just southwest of downtown um, Grand Rapids. And since um, they've moved in a while ago, all sorts of people from our community have been moving into this neighborhood, which um, is an un <laughs> must be a neighbor. Um, it, it's a, a really powerful thing that is happening in, in a neighborhood where the needs are... Uh, very visceral, very, very in your face, like this very under-resourced in the, in the kinds of things like food and 
and clothing and heat and such. And they have been doing, it's a really a powerful thing going on there. So, hi, welcome. Hi, everybody. You are the hardcore faithful. Well done. If you're like me, you walked out this morning and thought, I know I put my car somewhere. Uh, um, so it's always nights like this when we find out the hardcore faithful are here. I want to invite you to turn to the book of Luke, chapter 2. It's Advent. Advent comes from the Latin, which means toward the coming or in preparation for the coming. And it's, so it's this idea of Christ is coming. Um, and the, the birth of Christ is the coming of Christ into the world. And so Advent is when we turn ourselves towards the celebration of his birth, which is about the Christ who continues to come into our world. And uh, so we're going to talk, there'll be some sort of sermon at some point, and then, um, um, and then all sorts of other things. How about um, that new Christmas song? Is that not a brilliant song? How many of you, it's like got this kind of hoot nanny shuffle, kind of y'all come kind of thing, and I think maybe we should just have a bit of a sermon, and then we should do that song again in proper hoot nanny blow the roof off kind of form. Is that correct? So, so y'all... Um, we're going to go through some scriptures and stuff, but then I think at the end we just need to do that. And it, Thank um, you. And let's, let's just give people an idea of some of the things that are going on in the neighborhood. Um, somebody donated a warehouse space to build like a community center. So how's that going? Right. We have about 8,000 square feet in a warehouse at the bottom of our hill in the neighborhood. And it's divided up into two floors. So the top floor is pretty much done. We have a, a few more things, carpeting and a few more things to throw in there. Um, but the bottom floor isn't finished at all. So we're hoping to be working out of the top floor and maybe by January, February, and then hopefully the money will come for the bottom floor. Okay, and, and it's, what, what goes on at the warehouse? What's it for? At the warehouse, we're going to be doing all the programs that Dorchester House does, plus all the programs that the other ministries in the neighborhood do. There's four or five ministries from different churches that all work in the Black Hills neighborhood. So we've named ourselves United in Christ, and we're throwing all of our other names aside, and in the neighborhood, we're united in Christ, and so we're doing tutoring and God's Club there, um, Christmas, and yeah. go ahead. So, like with the tutors, um, tell, tell us a bit about where are you with how many tutors, and do you need more oh, tutors? For, uh... Let's back up one quick thing. I, every service, I forget to mention the prayer thing. There at the warehouse, every Monday night at 6.30, there's a group that meets and just prays for the warehouse in the neighborhood. So... If you're bored on a Monday night, come on down. Um, then at Dorchester House, we do tutoring, and we need another 5, 10, 15 tutors to go one-on-one -on -one with the same kid every week, every Wednesday, from January until June would be awesome. And, and a lot of the kids have no help at home, so right. this is huge right. for them. This is really huge for them. They don't have support systems at home. Moms and dads are working two or three jobs or... Um, other things are keeping them busy. And so this is a great support for these kids to, if they have questions for math, then they know where to go. They have a place to do that. And so we wanna, want to show them that education is super important and that with Christ in their life and a good education, they can pretty much go anywhere they want. And then God's Club is two God's, Saturdays a month? Yep, God's Club's the last two Saturdays of every month. And it's like a vacation Bible school time if you want to come down and play with the kids and share the love of Jesus Christ by being a positive role model. Awesome. I remember awesome. Um, being at a God's Club with you and you were feeding the kids. And there were kids putting the food that was left over um, in their pockets. <laughs> like, like they were putting hot dogs in their pockets. Um, and... It was because like the one, they, they did not know if they would eat later right. that day, and you all were providing food, and they were just stuffing it in their pockets as fast as they could because this was food, and they didn't know when they would eat again. Exactly. During the school year, the, most of the kids in our neighborhood get breakfast and lunch at school, and parents provide dinner. They provide one meal a day, and then um, on the weekends, they still provide one meal a day, or during Christmas vacation, they still provide one meal a day. But school's not around on the weekends, and it's not around during Christmas vacation, so you might not get breakfast and lunch. So this is the perfect opportunity, Rob has talked about this before, where you can play ding-dong ditch in my neighborhood with a bag of groceries. Leave a bag of groceries on pretty much any door in the neighborhood you would like. And uh, put, for the love of Jesus Christ, or something like that, Jesus loves you, or whatever. And then.